Today we're going to be talking idempotent uh, pipelines and slowly changing dimensions. Let's uh, let's dig into it. All right. So what are, what are we covering today? Two things really. Idempotent pipelines. So idempotent is a very interesting word. Uh, definitely look it up in the dictionary right now. And one of the things that you might notice after you look it up in the dictionary is you're more confused about what it actually means because the definition is kind of bullshit. Uh, and then we're also going to be covering slowly changing dimensions. Uh, dimension and not just slowly changing dimensions, just like dimensional data modeling in general. And the, the most complex part of dimensional data modeling is slowly changing dimensions. Uh, the rest of it is actually pretty straightforward. So I'm really excited to get through this with y'all today. Let's go. All right, so idempotent pipelines are critical. If you are writing pipelines that are not idempotent, you're going to be frustrating a lot of your coworkers. You're going to be creating all sorts of crazy data quality problems that are very hard to troubleshoot. There's a bunch of different things that can happen. So what does idempotent mean? Uh, I had y'all look in the dictionary, but here's the dictionary definition of idempotent. Denoting an element of a set which is unchanged in value when multiplied or otherwise operated on by itself. And a lot of you are probably like, what, what the hell is that? <laughs> like, it's a very like mathematical definition. Uh, the key thing to remember here is that your pipelines should produce the same results regardless of when it's ran. And it's more, it, it, idempotent captures more than just when it's ran. It has a, a bunch of other aspects to it as well. So your pipeline should produce the same results regardless of the day you run it, regardless of how many times you run it, regardless of the hour that you run it. So what this means is like when you are running your pipeline in production or you're running your pipeline in backfill, you should have the same data. It should be the same. Like it's not going to be any different. Like, and keeping in mind that a lot of this item potent stuff that I'm talking about really applies much more critically to batch pipelines than it does to streaming pipelines. A lot of times streaming pipelines are a little bit different and a little bit harder to like replicate, but even streaming pipelines can have their own item potent feel to them as well. So keeping in mind, the key here is these are the three things. Let's dig a little bit deeper here to kind of maybe have an example. So you want to be thinking of your pipeline like a mathematical function. So you can think of it this way. Uh, you have f of x equals 2x. Uh, you see, if you plug in 4, you get 8. It doesn't matter if you plug, if you plug in 4 on Christmas, you get 8. If you plug in 4 on New Year's, you get 8. You plug in 4 on 4th of July, you get 8. It's the same, always, right? So the key thing here with idempotent pipelines is if you have the same input data set, you should have the same output data set, f of x. It's like a function. It does a transformation that's like a function. But that's not always the case. And how when people architect their pipelines, that is not always the case on how they actually implement it. So keeping in mind that a lot of these functions, f of x equals 2x, that's an idempotent function, right? So let's uh, let, let's 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 dig a little bit deeper into like what this even means, you know. So why is troubleshooting non-item potent pipelines hard? So think about it this way: like, say you are running a pipeline in production, and then you find an error, and then uh, you backfill uh, because you want to fix a data quality bug, and then that actually changes the data because your pipeline isn't item potent. And so uh, your backfill data does not match your, your old production data. Even though you fixed a quality error, you have different inconsistencies in your data now because your pipeline is not item potent. Generally speaking, these errors are not caught anywhere. They're not caught by data quality checks. They're not caught by unit tests or integration tests because all of those are uh, make assumptions about like when or how many times that the that the pipeline is being executed. Like a unit test assumes that your pipeline is being executed one time, right? I mean, there are. I mean, if you're like a super sweaty engineer, you might be someone who is saying like, oh yeah, I uh, I, I I actually run unit tests to check if my pipeline is item potent. But like the number of uh, the number of those unit tests I've seen in my career, uh, like one one in ten years. So uh, I would say that that's probably not a very common thing to happen, but that's, that's a good test that you might want to 
consider putting in your pipelines. So uh, let's let, let's dig more here because this concept is very kind of tricky to explain. Okay, so what can make your pipeline not item potent? Because I think that's probably one of the things that uh, people here are like, what the hell? So think about it this way. Insert into is a great example of something that can be non-item potent. Because if you run insert into and you run it twice, right? You run your pipeline, it has insert into, you run it twice. Now you have two times, now you have 2x the data, right? It's not f of x anymore, right? Because the first time you plugged in the data, you got one result. The second time you plugged in the data, you got double the result. So it's not a mathematical function anymore. And it's not treated that way. The transformation is no longer item potent if you are just using insert into by itself. So there are some workarounds here uh, with insert into. Uh, a lot of people like to use truncate, where they truncate the table and then insert it in. Because then that makes it so it's item potent again, right? Because the whole flow ends up being like, you can keep running it over and over and over and over and over again, and you get the same result as you should. That's what item potent is all about. So uh, that's one uh, great example of when a pipeline could become non-item potent. Um, another one is, say you're using start date greater than. So... Imagine you're like saying, okay, I want all the data after uh, January 1st, 2023. Uh, one of the problems with that is you need to have something on the other end. You need to have a, a less than, and you, you got to process a window of data. And the reason for that is you can think about it this way. Like when you run it in production, say, say you want all the data after January 1st, 2024, and you run it in production on January 1st, you're going to get one day of data, right? That'd be one day of data. And if you uh, run it on January 7th, if you backfill January 1st on January 7th, now you're going to have seven days of data and so on and so forth, right? Like if you don't specify how big your window is supposed to be, you're going to, then when you backfill, you're going to have a bigger and bigger and bigger increasing window of data that is going to make your pipeline not item potent anymore. And uh, it, it there is a chance it could be item potent still based on like your where clause or things like that. That could definitely still uh, be the case, but it's going to be inefficient. Even if it's still item potent, it'll be inefficient because you're throwing away all that data. So keep it, keeping that in mind. Um, so another thing, another thing to think about is uh, your pipeline might not be using a full set of partition sensors where um, in production, you might be uh, running with an incomplete or partial set of data. And then your f of x equals y sort of situation is no longer the case because you changed x in this case, because you aren't waiting for all of your inputs to be ready. So y, y changes because in that case, you're running with an incomplete x. And so that's going to be another way that you want to make sure that you have your full set of partition sensors so that your pipeline is not running with partial data. You would be surprised. That is actually a problem I have seen like probably like at least two or three times a year in my time in big tech. Like, so it's a very, very common problem that like happens. So make sure like when you're running your partition sensors in Airflow that you are running them and actually checking for the full data that you're looking for. Um, last but certainly not least is uh, not using depends on past for cumulative pipelines. So cumulative pipelines are different than other pipelines in that each run actually depends on the previous run because it accumulates up. So why you have to use depends on past is you can't, you have to run that pipeline sequentially. You have to run, you have to run yesterday, then today, then tomorrow. That's the only way that you can do it. And so um, if you aren't doing it that way, then what can happen is you can run maybe yesterday and today or yesterday runs and then today doesn't run. And then when tomorrow gets here, if you aren't depending on yesterday, then that will run and it will break your accumulation and you will no longer have a cumulative pipeline. And so that can be a, a big problem that can happen. So make sure when you're running your pipelines and uh, checking for item potency that you are using depends on past in your cumulative pipelines. And letting y'all know, cumulative pipeline and a slowly changing dimension pipeline are the same thing. So the, it applies to a lot of the rest of this presentation as well. 
So here's some more things that can make your pipeline um, not item potent. Uh, I have some I have some good stories for you here. So uh, a lot of times, uh, data engineers have this uh, pressure to cut corners on their data sets because they need their data to be available sooner. So they just say, okay, give me the most recent version of a data set instead of giving me today's version of the data set. Because that, again, will cause inconsistent behaviors between production and backfill. Because when you backfill, you will have the most, the most up-to-date data, whereas in production, you probably picked yesterday or the day before. Like you won't, you won't have the, the most recent up-to-date data. You just have like whatever you currently have. So don't, don't do that. Like generally speaking, that's a bad practice, like a better practice. Like if you are in a place where you're building a pipeline that needs, uh, that kind of constraint is just wait on yesterday's data, like wait on the day before. And because then at least it's item potent because then backfill will have the same behavior as production. And so that can be a very powerful thing. I want to, uh, give a, um, a quick story here about one of the last things that happened for me when I was working at Facebook back in 2018. So I was working on this pipeline um, to detect like the inflows and outflows of fake accounts. So like, for example, uh, an account can be labeled fake and then they can be, they can pass a challenge and then they're not fake. They get unlabeled fake and then they can be labeled fake again and then they can be deleted. There's all sorts of different things that can happen in like the fake account life cycle. And so I was, I was building, um, a table on top of this table called dim all fake accounts. And I was tracking the inflows and outflows of the fake account kind of flow and process, mostly to monitor like the machine learning health. And one of the things that when we were doing this stuff, like I was producing all this data and then like the analysts were like, why doesn't this match this other table? Like it doesn't match the canonical user table at all. And like, I was like, I, this was a bug that I looked at for like a month and I couldn't quite figure it out. And then ultimately I realized that uh, that dim all fake accounts table that I was working with actually did this latest partition problem that was just terrible because then it made it so that no matter what I was doing, whether I was backfilling or I was in production, like you're going to, and like it, it'll be inconsistent with other tables as well because other tables might also be depending on the same data sets, but if they depend on them in an item potent way and you depend on them in a non, in a non item potent way, you're going to have inconsistent data and like people are going to be mad at you. Right? So keeping in mind that that's going to be the case the, there is one exception here. And the exception here is you can rely on the latest partition of a properly modeled SCD table assuming that you also rely on the daily dimension table so that you know that the daily dimension is ready because then you will be able to know that you can pick that SCD table. Anything else, relying on the latest partition of anything else is almost always a bad idea. Like it's, it, it, it produces all sorts of really hard to troubleshoot, really nasty bugs that I highly recommend you avoid. Okay. So remember uh, the pains here, like this is a, a very important part of what I'm trying to convey to y'all is the pains of not having item potent pipelines. Backfilling causes inconsistencies between the old and restated data. That is probably the biggest pain. It's so painful because like you just spent, because backfilling isn't fun. Even when it's, even when you do it right, it's not fun. It's probably one of the most pain in the ass parts of being a data engineer. And then imagine you go through all that pain and then you have inconsistent data and then you're going to have to backfill again. And that is when like, when you, when you got to do it twice, that's when like, you want to pull your hair out as a data engineer. It's not fun. Uh, other things, very hard to troubleshoot bugs. It's like, where is, why, why is it inconsistent? Like you could run, you could walk through all of your SQL, all of your SQL could be right. You could do perfect joins. All your joins are right, but you still can't find the, the quality bug because of the fact that your pipeline is producing inconsistent results when you backfill. Other things, uh, the unit tests cannot replicate the production behavior because if you're, re if you're relying on the latest uh, partition in production, you can't emulate that pattern with a unit test. So unit test coverage cannot save you when you are designing your pipelines with these uh, non-item potent errors in them. And last but certainly not least, uh, silent failures. Silent failures are my least favorite type of failure because they're very disrespectful, right? They really waste your time 
at least like when a pipeline fails or like with spark you know like you might get an out of memory exception and it like screams at you and it says like hey like we ran out of memory uh what's going on but like uh this 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 is not a problem here with non-item potent pipelines like uh, uh the air just doesn't show up doesn't show up it's not not there so uh that's definitely something uh to to consider when you are working through this kind of stuff okay uh we're going to be talking here a little bit about uh, slowly changing dimensions. Um, I will get you all this link here uh, when we go to YouTube. But like um, one of the things to think about is when you're modeling your slowly changing dimensions, uh, slowly changing dimensions have the possibility of being non-item potent, like fairly easily. And so uh, some people actually say that slowly changing dimensions are kind of a scam that they like we don't need them that it's actually better to keep daily dimensions so instead of like even though like you do get compression right so for example say i have my i'm on iphone uh on facebook right and i've been on iphone since 2014 so there's two ways to model that right you could say like i was on iphone today i was on iphone every single day for 10 years so there's like 3000 rows of me being on iphone that's one way to do it another way to do it is like you could model it like i was on iphone from 2014 to 2024, one row with a, with a range. That could be another way to do it. The problem with that range is that like it's not quite as item potent, like because you it, you can mess things up. So um, I don't know if y'all know uh, Max uh, Max Bjorkman. He uh, is the creator of Apache Airflow, and he says that SCDs are terrible and that we shouldn't be using them like at all, and that daily dimensions are the better way to go, mostly because storage storage these days is cheap and so if storage is cheap then why are we wasting all of our time modeling slowly changing dimensions when we can just have the daily value every day and we can just do it that way and honestly like there is a lot of merit to that like in my startup i do not model slowly changing dimensions there is no reason for me to model slowly changing dimensions my data is too small and like a lot of times the slowly dimension stuff that you get is only when you have very big, very big scale data, that's when you're going to start to see some big wins. So um, let's talk about the, the three ways that uh, you, can, uh, you can go, right? You can do latest snapshot, which is terrible, right? Latest snapshot is not item potent because if you use the latest snapshot for your dimension, when you backfill, it's going to be wrong. Uh, you can do daily, monthly, yearly snapshot. That's going to be better. That's an option that is very item potent. The problem with that one is that it doesn't compress very well and you have a lot of extra data, but storage is cheap. So generally speaking, that's also not a half bad option. And then the last option is modeling a slowly changing dimension. Um, so another thing to think about when you are choosing whether or not to model a slowly changing dimension is how slowly is this dimension changing? Because if you think about it this way, like imagine uh, you have a dimension that is changing every day then modeling it as a slowly changing dimension is probably pretty stupid because then you could just do a daily snapshot, call it a day, and it's simpler and you don't have to think about it, right? That I remember that was something uh, when I worked at Netflix and I was modeling instances, modeling EC2 instances, and the, I, the IP addresses associated with EC2 instances, they actually changed not every day, but every hour. So like it was almost like the opposite of a slowly changing dimension. It was like a rapidly changing dimension. And in that case, like you, you don't get any benefit from modeling it as a slowly changing dimension because you're going to have one row per day anyway, and you don't get a win. So generally speaking, when you're thinking about a slowly changing dimension, this is something that should maybe make one or two changes, like one or two changes, like a year. Like that's probably a pretty solid, like rule of thumb in terms of when you should model it as an SCD versus when you should model it as a daily snapshot. So th th just remember that uh, because I, I feel like a lot of times data engineers, they get into this habit of they want the data to be absolutely as small as it possibly can be, but they don't remember like one that they could be working on other things that are more important, like than getting another 2% win on storage cost. Or like another thing is, is like, just because it's smaller doesn't mean that it's easier to use because then uh, if you model as a slowly changing, 
then it can also cause non item potent problems, right? Whereas daily snapshots never have that problem. If you just use daily snapshots, you will never have the non item potent problem. So let's, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper in the slowly changing dimensions because it's a complicated topic as well. So first off, why do dimensions change? Uh, someone decides they hate iPhone and want to move to Android now or the other way around. I did that back in 2014. I, I used to be on Android and then I switched to iPhone. Um, someone migrates from team dog to, to team cat. So like when I was at Netflix, almost everyone at Netflix had either cat flicks or dog flicks uh, stickers on their laptop. And like back then I was like on team cat flicks, which nowadays I'm like, I'm such a different person now. I'm a very different person. I mean, look at, look at, look back there. You see that? That's a, that's, that's a, that's a dog back there, you know, and that, and the big old thousand dollar neon sign dog, right? I'm very firmly on team. If I went back to Netflix, I'd be firmly in team dog flicks, not team cat flicks anymore. Right. And you can think of all sorts of other ways. Someone migrates from us to another country. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways that dimensions can change, right? Cause your life changes over time, right? Like, Maybe you gain some weight and your weight dimension changes, or maybe you grow taller, or maybe like you get glasses or like, you know, there's all sorts of things that you could think of like as dimensions that could change, you know? Okay. So, um, so how can you, uh, model dimensions that change? Uh, some people and some data engineers, uh, they are tempted to model them as singular snapshots. So in this case, a singular snapshot would be uh, you have one data, you have one data set that uh, has whatever the latest value is for for me, right? So in that case, that data set would have I was on I'm on dog flicks, I would be on, on team dog now, but it would have no no understanding that I used to be a cat person. And so uh, you can see how like this type of dimension uh, storing things as singular snapshots would be bad. Because then if we backfilled using this as the source, then uh, my Catflix history at Netflix would go away. And uh, that would no longer be a thing. And so the backfilling of using that uh, snapshot would not work. Uh, it'd be very painful, very frustrating stuff to work with, right? So another option is you have daily partition snapshots. So in this case, you have like um, every day you see what the value is and you store that. So once a day, you take a snapshot of the dimension. Um, this does have some, uh, kind of trade-offs in terms of like, if you have a dimension that's changing more often than once a day, you only get the day over day change at, at the time of snapshot. So you can actually lose some, uh, like uh, some clarity on the actual dimensional mutations that are happening in that case. An another option there is you can do like CDC, like change data capture that can be another very powerful way to model your snapshots so that you have the the hourly uh mutations while also um like so you you actually get all the changes in the entire change log that can be another way to do it one of the things about change data capture though is like it has the change log and that kind of gives you a slowly changing dimension type two out of the box which can be really nice um the, the last one is we have a bunch of different ways to model slowly changing dimensions. We have types one, types two, types three, and there's also types four, types five, type six, type seven. There's like, they keep going on and on and on and on and on. And like most of them, you do not ever need to use. Like, it's like, it's one of those things that data engineers are like, oh my goodness, there's so many different ways to do this. But it's just like, you know, if you ever read that book, uh, JavaScript, the good parts, you know how like the normal JavaScript book is like, like five inches thick and JavaScript, the book, JavaScript, the good parts is like half an inch thick because you really just need to know the, the 20 or the 10 or 20% of data engineering that does 80% of the impact. So let's, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper into all the different ways that you can model these, uh, slowly changing dimensions. Okay. So let's talk about the types of slowly changing dimensions. So you have type zero type zero is a good one, uh, because type zero is, a dimension that actually isn't slowly changing. Like for example, my dog, Lulu, she's a Siberian Husky and she's been a Siberian Husky since day one. And she will be a Siberian Husky until the day she dies. So, and even, even later, like she's just a Siberian Husky. That's just, that's her, that's a dimension for her. That is actually not a slowly changing dimension. 
So if you're doing SCD type zero, remember that if you model it this way, it's not a slowly changing dimension. The only things that should be modeled this way are things that actually don't change, like my birthday. That's another great example. And one of the things you'll notice is there's actually not that many things that fit this bucket. Like another a great example is like registration date uh, for a user when they sign up. That's another kind of unchanging value. Uh, there's not that many uh, things that are completely unchanging. So generally speaking, you want to avoid type zero unless you're for sure, for sure know that it's not going to change. Okay, type one, right? So type one is when, uh, uh, don't use this, don't use type one, just never use type one. So type one, uh, slowly change a dimension when you're modeling it this way. Uh, you just don't care about backfilling. You give no, you give no shits about backfilling at all. If you use type one backfill is not, you, you, you don't, you don't do backfill. Backfill is a bad word. Uh, because if you model your dimensions as type one, you only care about the latest value, which means you don't give a single shit about backfilling. And so that's why in, on the slide, you see, I say never, ever, 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 ever use this type of modeling because it makes your pipeline not item potent anymore. Uh, this like, obviously when we're talking about modeling, uh, and data modeling, like I, like in this, in this context, I'm talking about analytical data modeling where you care about history and you care about trends and you care about all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you are talking about, uh, like more like, uh, relational data modeling, like where you're in like Postgres with primary and foreign keys and latest values in those cases, like type one probably fits. But I, and keeping in mind that uh, this entire presentation is all about OLAP and analytical data modeling, not uh, relational data modeling. So uh, let's uh, let's go to let's go to the next one, which is probably my favorite slide in this whole presentation. So type two, uh, SCD type two is uh, the gold standard SCD. Uh, one of the things to remember here about um, SCD type two is that it is what Airbnb uses. So uh, at Airbnb, when you are building out a gold standard pipeline, so they have this thing called the Midas, Midas process that creates gold pipelines that are very, very high quality, very, very high trusted. Uh, when you're doing that uh, and you're building an SCD pipeline, the only acceptable SCD modeling that they will allow is SCD type two. Uh, so... The way that SCD type two works is you have a history log of everything. So like, for example, I'll talk about my Android and iPhone. So like for me, I was an Android user from like 20, like 2009 to 2014. I was an Android user for like five years. So you can think about how there'd be like a, a record for like my ID, Android, 2009, 2014. So you have four, four things, right? You have the ID of the entity the dimensional value, the start date, and the end date. And then a lot of times these tables have one more column called is current, which will give you whatever the current value is, which is great because guess what? If you just filter this table to where is current equals true, guess what you get? You get type one and there you go. Now you get type one and you, you get all the benefits of type one and you get freaking an item potent pipeline. So it's pretty cool. So how this works, right, is... Um, for the end date in the pipeline, a lot of times like this is modeled in one of two ways. You either model it as null or you model it as like at Airbnb, we modeled it as 99991231. Like, you know, just a date really far into the future. Like um, hopefully like we have, we have stuff. Hopefully my pipeline isn't running that long because I hope my pipeline does not run for 7,000 years. That's a very long time. Um, so that's generally speaking how they model like the current uh, the current record is, uh, I like the nine, 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 12, 31 way of doing things, even though it does put like quote unquote fake data into the pipeline. And the reason for that is because I, um, it makes it so the between syntax works better because if you have like, you want to know like where start date and end date are between a, a given date. Uh, the problem with null is between, if you use between and one side of the, of the, of the interval is null, it just is always, it always returns false. So you can't get the record. Like, so you get nicer, like between syntax, if you model 
uh, the the end date as nine 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 twelve thirty one as opposed to null. Uh, I'm sure there are people in this uh, live stream right now that think that what I just said is absolutely absurd. And that's okay, because guess what? Data modeling is an art, not a science. And it's all about how you want to use your data. Um, so one of the things that's kind of tricky about SCD type 2 is that it's hard to use, right? Because uh, when you join, you're going to get like a history of dimensions as opposed to a single dimension. And almost always, you just want a single dimension. So in that case, when you're joining SCD type 2 tables, you have to join on the entity identifier, like my user ID. But you also want to join where the on the date, like whatever your reference date is. You need to say that this date is between the start date and end date of the dimension. So then you can, uh, it's, it's pretty great. That can be a really powerful way to model your slowly changing dimensions. So keeping in mind that SCD type 2 is my all-time favorite slowly changing dimension because of the fact that it is purely item potent. It's the only one that is. It's the only one, right? So keeping in mind that like all the other slowly changing dimensions that we're going to talk about today, you can just forget about. So I'm going to probably spend the next 10 minutes talking about things that don't really matter that much. But we're going to talk about them anyways, because I think that uh, I want to be exhaustive here just to let y'all know, because some of y'all might be interested in learning how to model slowly changing dimensions in a non-item potent way. So uh, let's dig a little bit deeper into like types two and type three and stuff. Okay, so type three. Um, so type three is a little bit different. Uh, what you get with type three is you um, you have one row per dimension. And in this case, you have the original value of the dimension, and then you have the current value of the dimension. And so this is pretty good. Uh, what the the goodness here is you get the you get one row per dimension again. So you don't have to have multiple rows. That can be a very powerful uh, thing in terms of usability. So this is uh, can be a lot more usable. Uh, the problem here, though, is if there is more than one mutation. So say there's three mutations. Like, for example, for me, I grew up in Utah. So my first um, uh, location dimension was Utah. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. And then I moved to California. And so in this data set, you only have the original dimension, which for me would be Utah, and the current dimension, which would be California. But then all of the data, uh, if I backfilled my data when I lived in D.C., it would um, either be attributed to Utah or California, depending on how you model this data set. So uh, this one is kind of a nice middle ground. Like if you're going to pick a different one besides type two, uh, which I highly recommend that you don't pick something besides type two because type two is the best. Um, if you pick something besides type two, I would recommend that you pick uh, type three because you do get a lot of uh, the value that you get from type two, but you get a lot of usability gains in terms of like only having one row per dimension. So that's pretty nice. Uh, but yeah, you do lose some clarity if there is multiple state dimensions over time. So uh, generally speaking, if, if you're running analytical pipelines, I would say avoid type three. I like, I, I use, I used type three before in my uh, like, in my uh, uh, relational data models and stuff like that so that we can keep track of whatever their first value was and then we can see how it changes over time. And that in, in those cases, we don't really care about the entire history. So we can actually just have all of these values. So this can be another great option for uh, modeling slowly changing dimension, but keeping in mind that this is not item potent, right? So you still get silent failures, you still get inconsistencies on backfill if you were using this type of slowly changing dimensions. So for me, for me, that 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 is the showstopper. That's why I'm like, screw this. I'm not I'm not going to use type three. But obviously, I'm sure people in the uh, people in the stream uh, might think otherwise. OK, so let's go over this again very quickly. Uh, so type zero and type two are item potent. Type two or type zero is only item potent because it's not a slowly changing dimension. It's a value that is the same all the time. So keeping in mind, like, for example, Lulu, my dog, is a Siberian Husky. 
and she's always going to be a Siberian Husky. I mean, maybe, maybe in the future, we'll get to some genetic engineering where you can change the breed of your dog halfway through their life, but we're not there yet. And they were probably still pretty far away from that. So, uh, that's how type zero works. So if I backfill any of Lulu's data and I put Siberian Husky in as the breed dimension, it will always be correct. Um, type two is going to be the other one that's item potent. And the reason why type two is item potent is because you get the entire history. You have the start date and the end date for every single value of when people were active and inactive, right? So that's going to be the other thing to think about when we are kind of going through a lot of the, the different values that we're working with today. Uh, we're going to be uh, jumping into a lab here in just a little bit uh, where we are going to be going over how to build a type two slowly changing dimension. So that should be really great. Um, uh, keeping in mind, now I'm going to be talking about the things that make me sad as a data engineer, uh, type one uh, dimensions. If your model is slowly changing dimension as type one, uh, you're a bad person. Like, don't do it. Like, that's just, that's just terrible. It's just really terrible. Type one is the worst. Like at least type three feels like you, you tried, like you tried and you gave at least a little bit of a shit about history. And so that's, what's great about, um, type three, uh, is that like, at least you, it looks like you tried a little bit. But type one is like, you're like, I don't care about history at all. I only care about the latest value. So keeping in mind that these are the ones, obviously there are other slowly changing dimensional values that you could possibly work with, like um, uh, type four, five, six. There's like a lot more slowly changing dimensions. Keeping in mind that I'm not covering those in this presentation because I've never used them in my career and I don't think that they're that valuable. But uh, maybe check out, maybe, maybe uh, this is something that can give you a springboard into looking into that for yourself. So definitely uh, read more into like the other types besides type three, because they, they, there's a lot. They, it just keeps going. The amount of modeling opportunities in data engineering is kind of too much. It's kind of like way too much. Okay, so slowly changing dimension uh, type two loading. So when you are loading your slowly changing dimension, there are two ways. You can load your slowly changing dimension in two ways. The first way that you can load it is you look at the entire history in one query and uh, it's inefficient because you process um, all the data, right? In one go and you just read the entire history and uh, it's one query and you're done and you have all of it. It's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the differences here because then you have incrementally low data after the previous SCD is generated. So that's where you take the, the current uh, today's snapshot and you add it on to uh, the SCD from yesterday. And then that's where uh, you are not reading in the entire history every day or the entire day, like daily snapshot history or whatever. So one of the things I want to talk about real quick here is like I worked on uh, unit economics at Airbnb for a while. And um, you can think of like unit economics as like uh, a slowly changing dimension because you can imagine like, say you uh, are, you book a reservation, right? And then there's a value associated with that, a revenue associated with that, but then we refund you later. So like depending on the day, like Airbnb has a revenue or they don't have a revenue depending on the day. So it's like a slowly changing dimension over time. So one of the things that I noticed like with that was like, I wanted to create the, the, the incremental uh, way of doing things, but it's complicated like for that one, because like the only way that you could do that is like, you have to pick a cutoff point of when like uh, uh, a reservation can no longer experience changes. And that one, I, I didn't understand like what would be the right cutoff point there. So I was like, okay, we'll just load in all of history every day. And that was like, I, I, as an engineer, I was like, why, damn, this is like very, very inefficient, but like also elegant because it's just one query is done. Right. And like, you can, you can look like you can, you don't even have to backfill, right. It's not like you backfill multiple stages in airflow. It's like you backfill one day and you're done. Right? It's pretty cool. But like, it also has its own problems. And, but that's what we're going to be going over in the lab today is how to load uh, the entire history in one query. Um, Obviously, uh, the other way to go is you can load the data um, incrementally where you have the SCD from yesterday 
and then you load in the, the, the data from today where a lot of that data will be unchanged. Some of that data will be changed. Some of it will be new. Some of it will be old, all that kind of stuff. And you have to like think about all of the different permutations there. And that can be kind of complicated. So um, that was always something I had a dream of doing when I was at Airbnb was to make uh, unit economics incremental so that like it wasn't like processing all of history every day. But then it came back to like me realizing that there were more important things for me to work on. That wasn't the number one priority. And so that's another thing to remember when you are working with slowly changing dimensions or any sorts of uh, data engineering tasks like, is these optimizations that you're talking about, like a lot of times they come at the expense of other things that you could be working on. And like, that's the last thing I want to say here about uh, kind of this slowly changing dimension modeling is that you have uh, like people like Max who say, this stuff is bullshit. Like we don't need to do this anymore. Like we can just hold on to all the data in the cloud as daily snapshots and we don't need to do any of this anymore. This is all like silly. And uh, and uh, Airbnb, the, the company itself actually kind of jumped back and forth between like that uh, mentality and actually doing the SCD mentality. And like, generally speaking, uh, my perspective on this, now that I've worked at startups at big tech and I've worked at like all sorts of sizes of companies and I have my own startup now is when you are at a small enough scale, SCD is a very stupid thing to do. It's a very like low ROI thing to do because like you don't need to do it. Like, cause the efficiency gain that you get is like, Ooh, I saved five cents in the cloud. Look at me. And I spent 10 hours saving five cents in the cloud. Right. Whereas like, as the company gets bigger and bigger, especially once they have like, I think that the cutoff here is like, once they have like 10 or 15 million users, that's when you're going to really start to see a lot more of the slowly changing dimension gains that you would expect to see. So anyways, uh, let's, uh, go, go a little bit. Let's, uh, let's, let's go into this. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause here for one second and let's, uh, I'm going to take uh, about five minutes here to answer any questions y'all have about the presentation before we dig into the lab. Uh, make sure that you have a dataexpert.io account. Uh, you can see that running across the bottom there. And then go to dataexpert.io backslash classroom backslash Zach Wilson. And you will be able to find um, a place where you will get all of the queries uh, notified to you in real time as I am doing them live. So anyways, um, if you're in the chat here, I will definitely uh, um, answer any questions for y'all on like what we can do, right? Um, yeah, Kansa, you said, can, can't we derive type three from a type two uh, table? 100%, you, that's 100% correct. And that's why type two is the best. Um, I think that that's uh, really awesome. But yeah, if anyone has any questions, just drop them in the chat. We will be uh, doing just uh, a quick little Q&A here for about five minutes. And then we will be going into the lab on this stuff. Mm -hmm. How about current and history tables instead of SCD type two? If it's huge table having 300 million records for users table i mean you can have that's another way to do it where if you model it that way but like the problem with uh doing current and history tables like that is um if people uh uh if you if if people have um what do i say here if they depend on the current table then they will oftentimes not uh they if they depend on the current table in their pipeline then they are going to inadvertently cause uh, non item potent problems, right? But that's usually okay. Like, uh, in, in my experience, I have done like the type one stuff, but I've also told people like this table is not meant to be consumed by a pipeline. This is meant to be consumed by analysts, right? And oh, the, the strongest way that you can do that is you take it out of the lake right? You move it to some other source, right? So for example, when I worked at Netflix, I didn't put the current, the current table in uh, the data lake. I put it in Druid, right? We move it into another source, right? Some other place that people can do fast analytics on it. And we move it out of the lake because the thing about it is, is like, if something's in the data lake, people are going to ETL it. This is how it works. If it's in the lake, it's going to be ETL for sure. So, um, what is the, 
Okay, let's see here. Have you seen any use cases where type two wasn't sufficient? No, nah, it's been pretty good. I actually found type two to be really, really solid. Um, you can get into some hairy cases where like, uh, if uh, it comes back to uh, Kunal, that comes back to where um, you, uh, what I talked about early, early on in this presentation, which was you modeling a slowly changing dimension. You have to be aware about how slowly it is, right? That could be another thing to think about, right? Is like how slowly is it actually changing? Because that can be another really powerful way to do it, right? So um, definitely, uh, I, I found it to be a very, very powerful use case. But like the only time that SDT type 2 runs into problems is when it's not a slowly changing dimension. It's actually a fast changing dimension. And you have so many mutations that like, uh, that like you actually have more records than you would in a daily snapshot scenario. So that can be another solid thing to think about. Uh, I have a question. Do you recommend a uh, change data capture table instead of SCD? That is not something that I can recommend uh, one way or the other. I think that there is going to be definitely two things. Actually, uh, it's because you're not signed in. Actually, that's why that doesn't work. Uh, uh, you need to log in. That's why that uh, that is not working, right? So I will, I'm going to show that off real quick. So if we go to that... I'm going to pop this guy over. We're gonna do, we're, we're gonna try to do this side by side. One second. Let me uh, let me change the. This is gotta make this guy a little bit smaller and see if that like actually works. Can is that like is that fixing that problem? Let's, can we do it that way? Okay, there we go. That looks better. Okay. Um, came from X. Kimball is worth reading on slowly changing dimension. Yeah, I, I like the Kimball books 100%. So um, we're mostly gonna be working in this uh, query editor today. So one of the things you might notice is uh, in here. So when I run a query here, you'll you'll get a notification right here, and then you can copy it. So if you fall behind, you will be able to catch up, and we'll be able to kind of work through this together. So the idea here, right, is we're going to find. Uh, it's, it's, it's if you were in my other lab or other live uh, where we went over consecutive streaks. This is going to be a very similar thing to that, right? where we have um, essentially all of these records here of like when someone was active, right? And, uh, or like we have all these NBA player seasons records, right? But one of the things that we need to see here is we actually need to create uh, the, the data for when they're not active, because that's another thing that's super important because one of the things is like when you're doing these slowly changing dimensions, one of the things that can often happen is uh, you need to model data that's not there, like when because like their dimension doesn't exist anymore because they aren't active anymore. So we're gonna be working with this table today. We're gonna say select star from bootcamp uh, dot mba player seasons, right? And you'll see in this, and I'm gonna say where player name equals uh, Michael Jordan, and you'll see oh, Jordan. This is gonna be what we're gonna be working on today. Uh, so this is obviously. Um, a table. Here's Michael Jordan. One of the things you might notice here is he was here in um, yeah, 1996, 1997, 2001, 2002. So he was also not active in uh, 90, 1998, 1999, and uh, stuff like that, right? So one of the things that we want to do is we actually want to have a record for him for every year. So then we can see when he was actually not active. So what we can do here is we want to go ahead and do, uh, we can say cross join um, unnest. And then in this case, we're going to say generate series. And then I think we can say, what well, does this work? I think this will work. 1996, we'll say to 2002 as T. I think this should work. Generate series. Okay, well, give me one second. Generate series Postgres. Oh, no, generate series Trino. What is it? Is a, uh, I, generate is it generate sequence oh it's sequence that's why it's a it's sequence that's what that that that, that makes a lot of sense let's uh let's go back in here so this is actually sequence here so if we do sequence this should give us what we're looking for there we go so now you'll see uh there should be uh you'll see where we have but the problem here is this is not quite right, right? Because we actually want this to be, um, we, we need it to be like, and uh, T equals season. 
Well, actually, no, because like there's going to be uh, records here that are like not there, right? You see how uh, we are cross joining, and then we'll have all the records here that will be. So this is going to give us the 1998, 1999 records. And then what we want to do is this is going to give us our sequence of all the values that we're looking for. Because our goal here is to just smash this data down to find the records where. Um, uh, so in this case, what we can do, right, is if we say um, player name and then we say um, season equals T um, as um, is active. Let's just run this real quick. This should give us a season. That's totally. Oh, oh, oh it's because this is. Uh, you got to call it like this. This is going to be. Um, we'll call this. We'll call this like exploded season. I guess we'll call it like. That's probably a good name. So we're going to say T because it's like that. The syntax is super weird. Like where when you want to explode out the the records. So this will give us. So you'll see here. We now have uh, what's put in season. Uh, and then we'll say uh, season exploded season, and then we can see which records we want here, right? Oh, I think we actually want exploded season here, exploded season. So this is going to give us whether or not they were active during that period, right? So what we can do here is now we can aggregate down, right? So if we say uh, group by, uh, we can say uh, uh, player name exploded season. And then we want to like we really want to put this as like a max here because this is uh, not what we need here. But this will give us all the records that we want, and this will now like you'll see one of the things. Oh, then what's order by here? We'll say order by exploded season. Now this should give us like an interesting kind of uh, way of looking at things. So you see, true, true, false, 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 true, true. So now what we want to do is. This is this is getting a lot closer to what we were expecting. But one of the things is is like, wait, we probably like we we can explode this out further if we want. But I want the queries to run fairly quickly. So what we want is we're gonna just put this in a CTE. We're gonna call this with all data. Let's call this all data as. And this is now. Um, and I'm gonna change exploded season and I'm gonna rename this as season, just so like in the in the later queries we can know this. So the goal here is we're just trying to create. A uh, slowly changing dimension for Michael Jordan from uh, to to show like when he retired, when he was active, all that kind of stuff, right? So then what we have here is so if we just say like select star from all data, this is now um, looking pretty good in terms of getting us uh, the same data set we're looking for, right? So now what we want to do is we want to look at. Uh, uh, we want to. We're going to be using some window functions here to understand the like the lag and the lead of these data sets, right? Of like of what's going on here. So let's go ahead and look at lag is active, comma one, right? So the thing about uh, window functions is they need to have uh, a window definition, right? So we can say over, and then in this case we want to say partition by. In this case we're going to say player name, and we want to say order by. And we say season. So this is um, as is active last season. So let's go ahead and run this. OK, so you see when uh, if they're true, true, then we can we can finally see like where they where there's going to be a switch. Right. So what we can do is we can make another column here where we can say is active equals this. Right, and there's like we call this at, or we're gonna call this as like a case when here. Say so case when, so uh, then zero else one end as did change. So this is just gonna give us our change value that we that we would expect, right? So you'll see here this makes sense, right? That we have uh, that for the true to false here did because uh, it's from null to true. Okay, that's fine. And then uh, when they didn't change. Then they did change, didn't change, didn't change, did change because he went back, right? So the whole idea here is we're trying to collapse all these records down just to be based on the continuous streaks for when the player is there, right? So in this case, we essentially, I want to move this guy into another uh, kind of CTE real quick. So we're going to call this as um, change identified. 
as. Now this is going to be our second kind of query here. Then what we can do is we can say uh, change identified. Now what we want to do is we want to kind of do a rolling sum here, right? So if we say sum, and then we say um, did change, but this is going to be a rolling sum, right? So we're going to say over, say partition by, uh, we're going to say player name, order by season as we're going to call the streak identifier. Very, very similar to uh, if you were in one of the previous uh, sessions. So one of the things you'll see here is now you'll see we have a streak identifier here of because he was active two seasons in a row and then three seasons he was inactive, 98, 99, 2000. And then he came back in 2001, 2002, right? And so, and you see all of these are now uh, values that we can work with, right? So this is going to be our streak identifier. I'm just going to call this, um, we're going to call this maybe identified as, and we're, we're getting really close to having our SCD. So then what we do is we say uh, select star from identified. Now what we want to do is we want to say, uh, we're going to say player name is active. And then uh, streak identifier. And then what we want to do is we want to say max season, min season. So this is going to be our, uh, we can say this as like, say as start season. This is as end season. And then we want to group here, right? Group by player name is active streak identifier. So this will give us a pretty cool little data set. Oh, I forgot. There we go. There we go. So now you'll see we have um, in this data set, we actually don't need a select streak identifier because that one's kind of like a hidden column that we don't really need to select. But uh, now you'll see, let's, uh, let's look here. So now you see how this, we have a start season, end season. Oh, I got that backwards. This is min and this is max. It's flipped, right? Uh, we'll run that one more time. And you'll see uh, we have our start season, our end season. And then you can see, okay, slowly changing dimension is active. Fall, right? So then like what we can do, right, is if we remove Michael Jordan from this and we run this, uh, this query again, you'll see this actually works across the board for every player, right? And you can see, okay, when they were active, when they were inactive, right? You can see all sorts of stuff like that, right? You can see exactly when uh, the players are active and inactive, right? Like, for example, this Fred Roberts guy was like one season, right? And then this guy was, you can see all of it, right? And you can essentially, this gives you your type two SCD, right? So the way, the, the one last thing I would probably recommend to do here is, so this data set actually goes to like 2021. And then what we can do here is, uh, the last thing I want to do here is we can say um, uh, is current, right? We can say as uh, uh, max season equals uh, whatever this last value is, right? This like, what did I put in there? Uh, 2021. So if we do that, and this is like as is current, there we go. Let's call that as is current. So we can have the uh, current value for people. So there we go. And then you can see like when people were around, right? So one of the things that's interesting about this, right? About this strategy is that this doesn't necessarily uh, like this kind of gives you dimensions for people before as well. So that's the one thing that's like not quite as good about this way of doing things about like, like the unnest here, because the um, this value here, this uh, be the beginning of the sequence really should be uh, like the minimum value for their seasons. Because you see, like, this guy, AJ Guyton, right? You see how, like, he really didn't even start playing, right, um, until um, 2000, right? He was not even in the league back then. This was his first season. It was probably 2000. So really what we want to do here is we want to uh, probably do one more aggregation ahead of time. So let's let's do that real quick. So let's say um, first season as... And then in here, we're just going to say select min or say player name min season from.
from bootcamp.nba uh, player seasons group by uh, player name. And I'm going to call this as first season. And what we want to do here is uh, we're going to just do a join here. I'm going to call this um, we'll call this uh, NP uh, join um, first season FS on um, I'm going to say NP dot player name equals FS dot player name. And then uh, in this case, we got to do the freaking like stuff here, right? Where we do like NP dot season, NP dot season. And then here though, we can say FS dot first season so that we don't uh, explode the sequence. Uh, so we don't get like data for people who haven't shown up yet, right? Cause that's going to be an important part of this kind of exploded uh, process here. So now if we run this query here, you'll see, um, Oh, player name is ambiguous. Where is that? There's a player name in here somewhere. Oh, it's this one, np.playername. That's what we got to do. There we go. So now uh, you'll see that like no player in here now is going to be uh, like, they won't have data before, before they were playing, right? Because uh, we only start the sequence from their first season. So then this gives us all of their data set and it goes from the first season all the way to the current date. So that can be another really powerful way to kind of generate all of the SCD tables and all this kind of stuff in uh, one shot. And this is going to be probably the, the best way to do this stuff. So I wanted to show um, what uh, uh, someone asked, like, how can you turn uh, this SCD type two? into a type one and into a type three. That was the other thing I wanted to do real quick. So let's go ahead and just uh, create a table here. So we're gonna say create table. We'll call this uh, Zach Wilson dot um, MBA players um, SCD as So this is actually gonna be moving the data. This like that's one thing that's really cool about this platform is that it actually like creates and uh, builds data so there we go so we have five thousand records now of different people transitioning so uh what we're going to do now is i'm just going to take this table and then i'm going to just stomp the rest of this so if i say select star from this table you'll see we have um exactly what you would expect this is going to be uh so this is our type one or this is our type two scd so to get to type one type one is very easy and this is why people who uh use type one, they're just kind of lazy sometimes. So we just say is current done, right? And now this will just give us all of the current values, right? So like coming back to what I was talking about with backfilling though, is that like you can model the table like this, right? And this is gonna be, uh, and the problem with that is like, if I say and player name, we'll say uh, player name equals Michael Jordan, one of the things you might notice here is this is going to be uh, we're going to we'll get one record, right? We'll get one record. It's nice. But you see, uh, then if we backfill, we backfill with this dimension, uh, then uh, Michael Jordan will just be retired, right? He'll be not active when he actually won six championships in the 1990s, right? So um, that's uh, this is where uh, type two or type, you know, I, the way that this would work is, I guess, to make it actually exactly type one is it's you don't have the start date and end date it's this is type like this is taking a type two and devolving it into a type one right so now this is now a type one um scd right where you have one value for every player and like this is like without filtering right you have one value for every player and whether or not they're active right easy but also terrible right because remember that like we don't want to backfill Michael Jordan and say that he won six championships while he was retired, right? So let's go ahead and um, look at how we can convert this as well into a type three SCD, which I think is another one that can be really interesting. So with a type three SCD, we're going to need to create, uh, we're going to say with first as, or we'll say with, or let's call this F as. And then in here, what we want to do is we're going to say select, um, uh, player name. Uh, uh, in this case, we're going to say, uh, it, so actually in this case is active is going to be like the fair, it's their very first original value. And in this case, like 
it's not always the case, like, because we're, we're, we're working with a binary here. Right. But like everyone's first value is always active, right? Because if it wasn't, they wouldn't be in the league. Right. So the, but the way that we can do this, right. Is we can just say, we can say is active from, um, we have our Zach Wilson player, NBA players. Right. So in this case, what we want to do is let's go ahead and create like a row number sort of thing. Right. So if we say like row number, um, over when you say uh, partition by player name and then um, order by uh, then we order by uh, uh, start season right and then this will give us we just say select star from F right this will give us uh, essentially whatever that first value is okay so that gives us our first value and then we just want to get um, so in this case, we can say uh, we, we also want to get our season or our start season and an end season. And then um, in this case, what we want to do is I'm going to call this um, as num. And then what we want to do is in this case, we're going to say player name. And then we want to say in this case, we're going to say um, uh, max. And we say case when num equals one, then is active as original um, is active. And we have max. Um, and then in this case, we would just say max case when end season equals 2021, uh, then is active. Oh, we need to end here, right? Then is active end as, and then in this case, this is going to be um, current is active. And then we just group, right? Group by player name. So now this essentially converts it fairly efficiently to um, uh, fairly efficiently to um, SCD type two or from type two to type three right and then this uh, will also have uh, like it, it, this all, this has a date in it right like you could also put like the original dates right and a lot of times they have that in type three where in this case you say max case when num equals one then and or then um start season and as um original start and then uh you do the same thing for this one but this one is like always the same because it's current right so usually this one is just like hard coded like as 2021 as um current start or current oh no actually no it is uh no they they are different never mind let's let's just grab this guy and this is a uh, start um um season and this is current start so a lot of times they do have like the date that they changed, right? So then you can kind of see, okay, so you see that uh, some of these people, like this guy here, right? He, he originally started in 2004 and then um, he retired in 2018. Uh, that's, you can kind of see that. But see, this is another thing that you could, you, you might make the assumption that he actually like, played for 14 years like like for example like if we say where uh player name equals michael jordan i, I think michael jordan will have will be very clear on um on this exact problem because of the fact that he uh oh i forgot that the where needs to go before group by sql fail okay so you see here how like um this one uh is kind of wrong right because you see uh like his current start here is actually not the right one right because this is when he retired like but like you, you would this is lying to you right a little bit because like this makes it seem like he he played for uh seven years here right but he didn't right he didn't and this is like this is showing the limitations of scd type three because of the fact that like it makes it look like he played from 1996 to 2003 but he had a whole nother uh iteration because his value changed multiple times so this is why like scd type 3 is not as good and it can cause a lot of other kind of um item potent problems and all sorts of things like that so that is um oh wow i guess like this has only been like about like 75 minutes so okay that's fine um i think that, that that that's pretty much what i wanted to show today in today's lab um uh i think one of the things was is things went a little bit quicker than i thought they were going to today which is 
kind of fine. So um, anyways, um, I want to open it up a little bit to questions uh, so that we can kind of go over more like what happened in the lab so that uh, y'all can be successful with your slowly changing dimensions. So um, yeah, uh, Vadit, you can query my table. Uh, all the like, So how it works, right? Uh, I, I guess that's a, probably a good thing to talk about. Like, so um, in, if you are creating data, right in this uh, in the in the boot camp right for example if i say if i try to drop table say i say drop table boot camp nba player seasons nba or nba player seasons it's not going to let me do this right because it says you can't drop it because the only so like you have a schema right your schema is whatever schema is up here and you can do you can create tables you can drop tables you can do whatever the hell you want in that schema and but like for reading data you can read data from wherever right reading is totally okay like re reading data can be done wherever you want to read data and keeping in mind that like in the future here we are going to be doing some pretty cool stuff like i have a leak code like experience that's almost done so that y'all can like try it out and like we have like we're gonna have like a hundred questions when we launch should be really great and they're difficult they're difficult questions like like what we just did is one of the questions right it's 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 not like oh like what is the average number of likes on a post or like you know those like very easy bullshit leak code questions it's not like that this is like going to be a very challenging difficult platform to work on and that stuff is, is going to be launching very very soon in like the next couple of weeks so i'm really excited to show you all that as well it should be pretty great um um is scd for a column or a table that's a great question so um i would say scd is mostly for a table it's going to be but like you can do uh you can do the same stuff uh with scd for multiple columns at the same time as well like so you know that did change kind of aspect so you can have a slowly changing dimension table that tracks multiple columns at the same time so you aren't just tracking like is active but you might be tracking like were they active and good or like were they active and something else like some other uh attributes you can track like so the, the pattern i just showed you like if you go back to like what I, we, we were doing here before where we had like the did change let me let me go back to that real quick we have it here somewhere is it this one no it's player name is active oh yeah this guy let's let's uh, um let's copy uh yeah let's copy this guy here with lag 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 yeah this guy can we yeah this guy so um let's copy him and put him back up here so uh you'll see when we uh do the um did change right there's like a freaking did change thing here um that did change function oh wait where is that ah. oh yeah right here like because you can see like you can have different ways that that did change function can manifest like this this query here is another example of like doing a very similar thing but like with um consecutive season or consecutive seasons right so and like this thing can be like you can you can do a multiple things where like the, like nothing has to change like if nothing changed then zero otherwise one and so you can track multiple columns at the same time usually speaking like uh like a slowly changing dimension is like you can model multiple columns at the same time it's just that um like and and usually almost all the columns in the table are gonna be slowly changing except for like the identifier column so yeah it should be pretty good um for the same table can we see an example of type six i mean i didn't i didn't prepare for that so probably not but um yeah that's <laughs> uh so that's essentially um what's going on here but like that's a good um uh, maybe that'll be a good uh one for uh uh, uh for another session you know what if we want to track changes for two columns in the same table? How does SCD type two works here? The same. It's the same. Like you just have two columns and then you have a start date and end date. And then if either of them change, then you need to have a new record, right? So just like what we did before, where like if either of the columns change, we need a new record. That's like that did change value, right? Where like where we had it before, uh, th that one will have multiple uh, records when you're coming up with new new streaks and stuff like that, right? So awesome. Thank you so much, Sebastian. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, y'all are liking this. I'm, I, I've been really putting a lot of time and effort and energy into this stuff. And I really am really grateful for every, each and every one of you uh, showing up and uh, supporting me as I go through this journey. Um, and I realized I needed to turn this guy off. I should have a bigger face.
But um, anyways, uh, the one last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, we have about, um, I'm going to be doing a boot camp from uh, May 6th to June 14th. Uh, and we are still accepting early bird sales, which is going to be the cheapest you can get the bootcamp for. Keeping in mind, this is cheaper than you can get it anywhere, uh, uh, any other time and cheaper than any other bootcamp I've ever done. So uh, if you do early bird V4 at checkout, uh, you'll get 20% off. And so you can get 20% off. We're going to be covering a lot more of the stuff in a lot more detail and a lot more. Uh, and there's going to be like, Think about it this way, like we're going to have like freaking like eight hours of this, right? So like you can really grind and really understand like the, the trade-offs and benefits and risks of all of the different things that you can do here. So uh, definitely highly recommend checking this out. Uh, you will also be in a community with a lot of other people who are highly motivated to learn. We already have like about 65 people who have bought. So I'm hoping this will be my biggest boot camp ever. And yeah, and this uh, for, with the twenty percent off, you can get the whole boot camp for about sixteen hundred, and it should be a really, really, really great time. I'm really, really excited uh, for y'all to uh, to join the community and all this stuff. We have a really, really great community as well of very highly motivated data engineers. And at the end of the boot camp, if you put in all the effort to get certified, we will match you with a mentor who will help you change your life and change your career. So yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for all of this. Um, Kansu, the bootcamp is, um, uh, it is an analytics bootcamp. It's a mix of analytics and data engineering. So, um, you can just do analytics itself. There's the analytics track of the bootcamp as well. So if you just want to focus on that and you don't care about like Flink and Spark and all that technical stuff, you can just focus on the analytics side of it where we go really deep into every, every single thing in analytics that you could think of. And, uh, it should, so it should be a really, really great time. I'm really, really excited. Uh, but yeah, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm really, ha I'm really happy that y'all, uh, you know, entrusted me with your eyeballs and your attention today. And I hope y'all have a fantastic Thursday. And um, I'm excited to keep doing these. And uh, keeping in mind, five, five to six, five to seven, around that time on Thursdays, we will be doing these at least until the boot camp launches in May. So uh, we're going to be doing these uh, for the next couple months. Uh, hopefully, uh, like we can get to 100K on YouTube in that time as well. So make sure to subscribe to me on YouTube, by the way, as well. So, um, so uh, Sebastian, uh, if you want to, to have the the boot camp, uh, if you just do go to dataexpert.io or dataengineer.io, they both they both work. Uh, uh, you can just uh, like I'll, I'll I'll put that in the the channel here as well. If you go to dataexpert.io, this is going to be one where one place to go or dataengineer.io. I, I'm kind of in a middle of a rebranding, so I kind of I'm using both of them right now, and they both will take you to the same place actually. So, and then you can learn more about like the curricula. So, okay, hi Zach, you have showcased interesting ways to derive SDGs against base tables or views. In a typical warehouse or DB, would you create SDGs as store procedures or a set of tables? Always a set of tables, like always a set of tables. Never, never don't do SCDs as a, as a view. It's like, like you saw that and how nasty that was, like that view that exploded the data and was like, Wah! right? Like, nah, nah, definitely not. <laughs> awesome, everyone. I hope you all have a, um, a fantastic evening. Uh, yeah, this is it, Thal. Uh, uh, th thank you so much.